Hi everybody, having understood the merits of expansionary fiscal policy, let's in this video look at the other side of the coin, starting with the problems. A couple of the major issues are macro objective trade-offs that come with using expansionary fiscal policy. Now we know that if these policies are successful, aggregate demand will increase in the economy, let's say from 81 to 82 in this diagram, and with that we would see higher economic growth and lower unemployment. Great stuff! But a major side effect could well be higher demand pull, inflationary pressure. And if that means inflation overshoots the target, that's not desirable. That conflict of macro objectives is not what we're trying to do with expansionary fiscal policy. At the same time, if economic growth increases in the economy, that means higher incomes for households. And that will mean more spending on imports, which could widen our current account deficit, a trade deficit. It's called the sucking in of imports effect, right? The sucking in of imports as incomes rise and households spend more on imports. So these macro objective trade-offs are not desirable, but could well occur if expansionary fiscal policy is used. At the same time, government finances are likely to worsen with expansionary fiscal policy. Budget deficits could rise, that's the amount of government borrowing in a year, but also the total debt that the government has, the national debt, could increase as well. So the question is, how are these policies going to be funded? Will it mean cuts to government spending in other areas of the economy? Cuts to health, cuts to education spending, cuts to infrastructure, public sector wages, welfare. Well, that could harm those people who are reliant on that government spending. Does it mean higher taxation in the future? Well, which taxes are going to rise? Income tax, corporation tax, that could harm long-term growth rates. That could harm incentives as well. Does it mean an increase in regressive taxation? Well, that could burden the poor and widen income inequality. So we can question whether taxes will have to rise in the future and the impact of those tax rises. At the same time, maybe governments will just rack up more debt. Well, there is a big opportunity cost that comes with paying debt interest, unproductive government spending, money that could have been used much more productively in the economy. Something else to bear in mind is that if households in the economy know that the government can't afford expansionary fiscal policy in the form of an income tax cut, then households could well save the tax cut now, expecting a tax rise in the future, known as Ricardian equivalence. And in that sense, an income tax cut will not boost the economy's theory suggests. So the concept of Ricardian equivalence, a very uh, professional way of evaluating the effectiveness of expansionary fiscal policy. We can also look at the crowding out effect, and this is when government spending is heavily borrowing fueled. Debt fueled government spending could well crowd out the private sector and reduce private sector investment. I have made a very detailed video about the crowding out effect, which you can watch and get detailed understanding of what this is. But basically, if government spending is highly debt fueled, borrowing fueled, that's going to increase demand for loanable funds in the loanable funds market, which pushes up equilibrium interest rates. And that means it's more expensive for private businesses to borrow, more expensive therefore to fund their investment. And if it means there's going to be less investment taking place, the private sector is going to be crowded out. And that's bad news for long-term growth rates, but also it's bad news because it means more dependence and reliance on the economy for government spending to boost economic growth, which is not good for the long term. Government spending could well be X inefficient. We know that governments lack a profit motive. That's not why they engage in economic activity and spend. And what it means is that government spending could be wasteful uh, for government infrastructure projects or in government organizations, costs could spiral out of control. And that's what you're likely to get if you have excess government spending, the risk of X inefficiency and excess costs with government projects. But also, expansionary fiscal policy can have time lags. Government spending on infrastructure projects will mean rounds of government spending. So you're not going to get the big boost of AD until the project is finished. But also tax cuts, income tax cuts and corporation tax cuts will take time to feed through into the economy. You know, uh, Households will take a bit of time before an income tax cut will be spent and a corporation tax cut will take time before businesses invest those increased retained profits. So bear all that in mind as well. Now let's look at some key evaluation points when it comes to you know, looking at the effectiveness of expansionary fiscal policy. A lot of these evaluation points will showcase the big debate between Keynesian and classical economists when it comes to expansionary fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy is very much a Keynesian idea, so bear that in mind as we go through these. Right, the first point is to critique expansionary fiscal policy by questioning the size of the output gap. The effectiveness of expansionary fiscal policy very much depends on this. This diagram makes that very clear. If the economy, let's say, is close to full employment at Y1, AD1, with a very small negative output gap, 
It means that expansionary fiscal policy is less likely to be effective in boosting growth and reducing unemployment. We can see from an AD shift from AD1 to AD2, demand pull inflation is more likely to occur than any benefits of higher growth and lower unemployment. However, if the economy is in a deep recession, let's say AD3 with growth at Y3, there is a large negative output gap, a lot of spare capacity, expansionary fiscal policy has got greater potential to be effective in boosting growth and reducing unemployment and, crucially, without much of a conflict of demand pull inflationary pressure. The effectiveness of expansionary fiscal policy also depends on the size of the multiplier. We can look at this in two ways. And we can say that if the multiplier value is large, then the impact of expansionary fiscal policy is likely to be greater. Let's say the economy is at 83. Expansionary fiscal policy could boost um, aggregate demand, but not just finish at 84. There could be further rounds of spending and income growth in the economy. And therefore, the final increase in AD could be much further to the right, meaning that the impact on growth is much greater. Also, though, there is a risk of greater demand pull inflation with that. But another way of looking at the size of the multiplier is by saying if the multiplier value is large, it means there is less need for very heavy expansionary fiscal policy. Large increases in government spending, large decreases in taxation is not as necessary because the multiplier effect will do the majority of the work. So it reduces the need for high government spending and large tax cuts. And therefore, the impact on government finances may not be as large as well. We can question consumer and business confidence when it comes to income tax cuts and corporation tax cuts. If consumer confidence and business confidence is low, an income tax cut might be saved and not spent. Businesses might not use increases in retained profit from corporation tax cuts to invest necessarily. So that's a very good evaluation point. Another key point to consider is the current state of government finances before expansionary fiscal policy is enacted. If the state of government finances is dodgy with very high budget deficits or high levels of national debt, then maybe expansionary fiscal policy can't be afforded. The government might be breaking its fiscal rules if it went ahead with it. On the flip side, though, if government finances are in a stable way with uh, low budget deficits, maybe a budget surplus, or with uh, low levels of national debt, then maybe expansionary fiscal policy can be afforded without many detriments of worsening government finances in the end. And also we can bring in quite a few evaluation points which critiques the impact on government finances from expansionary fiscal policy. The first point to consider is the short run, long run effects of expansionary fiscal policy on government finances. Now, a lot of these policies could well lead to long term returns to the government via higher tax revenues. So government spending on education, infrastructure, healthcare, again, provides long run growth and long run benefits to the economy, greater economic activity and greater returns, tax revenue returns to the government over time. Same thing with tax cuts, income tax cuts, corporation tax cuts generate long term economic activity in the economy and thus could provide tax returns to the government over time. And what it means is that, yeah, in the short run, there might be higher debt because of expansionary fiscal policy. But in the long run, maybe the returns outweigh the increase in short run debt, short run, long run consideration there, which is quite interesting. We can also bring in some Laffer curve ideas as evaluation. I've made a detailed video about the Laffer curve, which you can watch and understand this in greater depth. But the basic idea is that an income tax cut may actually lead to higher tax revenues for the government, very much going against what theory would suggest. And that is because of the incentive effects that an income tax cut generates. Those who are in work have an incentive to work harder, to work longer hours, to be more productive. Why? To earn more income because they can keep more of that income as disposable income. That's going to increase tax revenues for the government. Entrepreneurs have an incentive to take more risks, to be entrepreneurial. Why? Because if they're successful, they can earn more incomes and they can keep more of it as disposable income. Again, that will increase tax revenues for the government. But also, if income taxes are cut, it reduces the incentives uh, to tax evade or to avoid paying taxes, and that could increase tax revenues for the government as well. We can also talk about the role of the automatic stabilizers. The next video in this playlist goes into this in far more detail. But the basic idea is that if automatic stabilizers are there in the economy and they're very strong, it reduces the need for expansionary fiscal policy in a recession. And that's because automatic stabilizers help to support output in a recession. And if they do their job very well, there isn't as much of a need of what we call discretionary fiscal policy. That's expansionary fiscal policy on top of the automatic stabilizers in a recession. That will reduce the overall worsening of government finances that we talked about before. Now, this is very much a Keynesian versus classical idea. The crowding out effect versus the crowding in effect. 
Keynesian economists would disagree very strongly with the crowding out effect, as we've talked about. And they would say, look, in a recession where expansionary fiscal policy is very much needed, they would say that the risk of the crowding out effect is very low. And that is because there is a glut of savings. There is a huge amount of savings taking place in a recession. And therefore, the chance of equilibrium interest rates being pushed up via debt fueled government spending is very low. So they would say, look, the crowding out effect is not really an issue in a recession. But deeper, they would say that in a recession, government spending, that is debt fueled, doesn't matter. But government spending could crowd in the private sector. And crowding in is when government spending creates demand in the economy, generates output, generates economic activity, which incentivizes private sector businesses to tap into that and invest and grow their business. Why? Because there is greater profit potential when there is more demand in the economy. And that's actually crowding in. That's creating more private sector activity and doing good to the economy. So they fundamentally disagree with crowding out and say in a recession, it's more likely we're going to crowd in the private sector and promote private sector activity. And then the last key evaluation point is the classical view that expansionary fiscal policy in a recession is not necessary at all. Why? Because the economy will self-heal, it will self-correct itself. Eventually wages will fall and with that the economy will return to full employment on its own. And they would say therefore the need for debt fueled expansionary fiscal policy that will burden future generations is not necessary at all. Don't do anything, no intervention by the government, leave the economy on its own and it will self-heal. So that covers, guys, everything you need on the other side of the coin of expansionary fiscal policy. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next video.